Hey Biology 10 students, Mrs. Erickson here with the 13.2, 13.3 lectures in biology focusing in on biotic and abiotic factors and then um, <clears throat> as well as looking at energy and ecosystems. So DQ, um, yesterday we talked about the two types of observations and they could be direct or indirect. So there's a picture here of a footprint and I'm asking is it direct or indirect? And you should be saying indirect, okay? Okay, okay so 13.2 and 13.3 objectives. Today I want to identify biotic and abiotic factors in an ecosystem and then focus in on how you can change one factor and how it kind of has this cascade effect, it can change multiple things in an ecosystem. Look at the roles of producers and consumers in our ecosystem and then finally compare photosynthesis to chemosynthesis. And I like this quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, the creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. Okay, so take a look at this picture here. I have three different soil types. Um, so if you were to pick up a handful of each soil type, what differences do you think you might find? So for those that, you know, uh, garden or are farmers, um, you know, you, first thing you, you would notice is maybe coloration, okay? And light color, dark, almost looks heavy, wet, if you will, and I don't know, clumpy, brown. So, you know, maybe it has different contents. Maybe this one's got more organic matter versus this, these two over here. Uh, maybe this one looks, to me, look, looks a little bit more clay. Um, maybe this one has more sand. And um, what I'm trying to get at is that... Soil is abiotic. Bi it's a non-living thing, but you can have different types of soil um, due to moisture content or organic matter, if you will. So an, sorry, an ecosystem includes both biotic and abiotic factors. So biotic factors are things that are alive. So plants, animals, fungi, bacteria. And then uh, abiotic factors are non-living things. Moisture, temperature, wind, sunlight, soil. So if I go back to <clears throat> the soils here, the types of soils is going to have a, a, an effect uh, as to what type of vegetation you might find. You know, usually a woodland soil might be rich with organic matter and can hold water pretty well. Whereas sandy soil, maybe this is more sandy, um, has little organic matter and won't hold water as well. Okay, so abiotic factors can have, play a role as to what kind of biotic factors you might find. <clears throat> so changing one factor in an ecosystem can affect many other factors. <coughs> Excuse me. Abiotic factors Im impact the amount of biodiversity. And so like, um, for example, does, um, you know, like let's look at the Caribbean Sea. You know, coral reefs are located near saltwater marshes. They usually have more fish than the reefs uh, do farther out the sea. And um, a key factor is the mangrove trees that live in the marshes. And these trees, you know, they provide food and shelter for newly hatched fish maybe protects them from some predators, and as they mature, they swim to the reefs. So some abiotic factors to look at would be, you know, how do abiotic factors affect the growth of the mangrove trees, you know, in low levels of oxy oxygen and in mud and um, changing levels of salinity or saltiness due to those daily tidal changes. So again, abiotic factors do impact how much biodiversity you'll have, which kind of ties into keystone species. So keystone species are species that have a really, really large impact on their ecosystem. They kind of hold the ecosystem together. If you don't have this species in the area, you're not going to have a function in ecosystem. So some examples of some keystone species are beavers. Beavers, what they do is they build these dams. <clears throat> and um, when they construct their dams, they create an ecosystem that a wide variety of species can accommodate or live in. Uh, so the beaver dam kind of creates a wetland system because it's a dam and so water starts stops you know flowing so you have still water so a wide wider variety of fish are able to live in the still waters 
Um, the fish attract fish-eating birds such as herons and kingfishers. And then you have insects that inhabit the pond and the dead trees along the shore, attracting insect-eating birds or flycatchers or nests in the tree cavities. And then not only that, you get waterfowl nests along the shorelines. And the animals that prey on these birds or these eggs are also attracted to this pond. And it's all because of the beaver. I put the salmon down because yesterday we read in the first paragraph um, talking about how uh, wild Pacific salmon, they're basically threatened with extinction due to competition from hatchery of fish, locked river paths, and spawning grounds. And salmon, they, you know, it's a main food source for several species of wildlife, actually over 100 species of wildlife, including the grizzly bears. So if you were to remove the salmon, you know, how are these other species going to be affected? And so um, that's a question that we're trying to answer. And I think I had this down here. Explain why the Pacific salmon introduced could be considered a keystone species. Well, they're a main food source for over 100 different species of animals. And if you take away that food source, now these animals have, have to find a new source of food. I want to uh, talk about one more example of keystone species looking at otters, sea otters in particular. Um, so sea otters really like to eat sea urchin. Okay, And these sea urchins, they like to nibble on kelp. The sea otters keep the sea urchins in check because they eat them so then the kelp can grow. And kelps are basically like underwater um, forests, a huge habitat to a wide variety of life. I mean, these, these, uh, the kelp can be like 100 meters long. They, you know, it, it's like an underground forest. Think Finding Nemo, okay? Now, if there are no sea otters, the sea urchin population explodes and they overgraze the kelp, destroying the, the homes of different species. And so now you don't have a wide biodiversity. So low biodiversity without the sea otters, high biodiversity with the sea otters. I should say that, you know, they call it a keystone species because um, to build like an arc, this is the keystone. So if you were to remove this and everything else collapse. So that's why they call it a keystone species. Okay, moving on to um, 13.3, energy and ecosystems. So here I have the equation. And does anyone know what this equation means or what it represents? Hopefully, you should be thinking photosynthesis. Okay, so photosynthesis captures the sun's energy and transforms it into a chemical energy that we can use. Um, and this is super important because you can trace basically all energy um, back to the sun. Okay. Thank you, photosynthesis. So producers produce energy or provide energy for other organisms in an ecosystem. They get their energy from a non-living resource. Um, so one example of a producer would be a photosynthetic organism because they are getting energy from a non-living resource, in this case the sun, and they're making their own food from it. So we also call producers autotrophs, they make their own food. Now consumers have to get their energy by eating other organisms. And so because they get different nourishment, they can't make their own food, we call them heterotrophs as well. Um, so producers, plants usually, consumers, you know, rabbits, humans, um, yeah. So here's a global vegetation map. And uh, basically it's looking at chlorophyll abundance to show where the producers are distributed in the world. And so dark green areas are heavily forested while um, in this case, brown areas have limited vegetation. So you can see that we have lots of vegetation near the equator due to the tropical rainforests. We have the Appalachian Mountains here. The, yeah, Appalachian Mountains. Um, more tropical rainforest here. Now, almost all producers get their energy from sunlight. Um, so. They get it from sunlight, it's through the process of photosynthesis. They take light energy, light energy comes in, um, and it gets converted into a chemical energy, in this case sugar. So light, carbon dioxide, water, out comes the sugar, that's the carb, and oxygen that we in, um, breathe in. However, there's a second way that you can get energy, um, not through the sun, okay? And it's called chemi, um, chemo, sorry, chemosynthesis which is a process by which an organism forms carbs using chemicals rather than light as their energy source. So instead of using sunlight, they're going to use chemicals around them. 
you usually find us at the bottom of the ocean floor. So uh, I think back in the 70s, people were discovering the ocean floor, you know, and they noticed that there was these deep sea vents and they found thriving ecosystems in places where it was super hot and no light. And what they realized was that there's these tiny little prokaryotes were making their own food from the minerals in the water. So through these uh, heat deep sea vents, um, superheated water sh shot up and there was minerals that the organisms could take from and convert it into a carb that they could use for energy. Um, in addition, chemosynthetic bacteria, like uh, the one here shown in this um, one of uh, Yellowstone National Park's hydrothermal pools, um, is also chemosynthetic. Okay? Uh, in this case, we're using a hydrothermal vent where chemical energy like uh, is uh, used to change CO2, water, hydrogen, sulfide, oxygen into a super rich um, sugar molecule. Okay, and usually sulfuric acid is released as a waste product. Okay, question for you. How would a long-term drought affect producers and consumers? I'm hoping you're thinking many producers, you know, would die because they don't have water. And then fewer planting and consumers would survive and reproduce, affecting food availability to other consumers. Second question, how do photosynthesis and chemosynthesis differ? So here's the two equations. The top part is photosynthesis. Six molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of water produces a glucose and six molecules of oxygen. Here's chemosynthesis, six molecules of CO2, six molecules of water. In this case, three molecules of um, hydrogen sulfide yields the sugar and then sulfuric acid as a waste product. And so I'm asking for differences. In this case, um, this is the difference right here. Okay, they're they're using chemical, like a different um, source of energy, or you know, to get to get their 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 carb. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Oh, not working. Okay, so that is thirteen two and thirteen three. Um, and there is an assignment. Remember, tomorrow we're going to head out to Wildlife Acres, so I need you to bring warm clothing um, for a quadrant lab. We're going to sample some species that we can find in Wildlife Acres and try to estimate how many species are actually there. All right, thank you.